Thank you so much, Jana. Uh, what a lovely introduction. I've taken the enthusiastic a lot. I forgot to tell you, sorry. <laughs> um, for, for the reason that I think it actually uh, doesn't have anything to do with this paper. <laughs> I mean, there is, but there's, it's not just that. So, scholars agree that without the swift and prescient action taken by the paper chamberlain Pierre Cross, immediately following the election of Bartolomeo Brignano as Pope Urban VI in Rome on the 8th of April, 1378, the election of a second pope, five months later, which inaugurated the Great Western Schism, may never have happened. Seeing that Urban VI had been elected under a certain duress by a tense conclave of cardinals, with the Vatican besieged by the Roman people, clamoring for a Roman or at least an Italian pope, Pierre de Croce seized the papal treasure to keep itself safe in the Castel San Angelo. Among the most valuable items were the matrix of the verso of the papal bulla, the seal with the faces of the apostles Peter and Paul, and the papal regalia, including the pope's tiara, so to have been the one granted by Pope Sylvester. Thus, when five months later, at Fondi, on the 16th of September, the same group of cardinals declared Urban VI an intruder and proceeded to elect Robert of Geneva as Clement VII, the second new pope could be properly crowned and take up the business of papal government. In fact, most of the treasure was at any rate still in Avignon. When the previous Pope, Gregory XI, had moved the papacy from Avignon back to Rome in 1377, a year before his death, he had only taken part of the treasure with him, the greater part of the goldsmith's work, the textiles, and most of the papal library, together with the majority of important documents, had remained in the city of the Rome, together with the treasurer, Pierre de Vagnol. Following Clement VII's election, Pierre de Croce returned to Avignon with the part of the treasury that Gregory XI had taken to Rome. And when Clement VII finally re-entered Avignon himself on the 20th of June, 1378, joyously received by the burghers, and escorted to the papal palace under a dais of gold cloths, he found his entire treasure ready for use. The family of furniture, hangings, liturgical robes and objects, the important papers and books, and not least the costly objects that could be liquidated if necessary. This substantial treasure was mainly a 14th century collection. Before the papacy, it's probably too small to read for anybody, but you probably remember your 14th century popes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope. Uh, before the pope papacy settled in Avignon, the popes, when they were present in Rome, had left their books and belongings in the Sacrario of the Vatican under the control of the Sacrista and later in the Vestiarium. The office of treasurer had developed only in the 13th century as a result of an increase in paper wealth and objects. In 1295, Boniface VIII ordered an inventory to be made. He was the one who died at Agnani um, uh, after having been looked at by the um, uh, Philippe uh, the Fair's man. Boniface's successor, Benedict XI, had taken his treasure with him on his journey to Perugia, where he died in 1304. The following Pope, Clement V, was in France in Bordeaux when he heard of his election, slightly later in 1305. He ordered that the part of the treasure that had been left in Perugia, an important part, should be sent to Lyon, where he wanted to be crowned. No idea of returning to Rome at that stage. Unfortunately, on arrival in Lucca, 
the treasure fell into the hands of the Ghibellines and the Ugochona de la Capjola and was decimated. The larger part of Bonifar's treasure had been sent from Perugia to Assisi, where it was presumably safely stored in the upper church until the town also fell into the hands of the Ghibellines and the Muzio, who took all the money and precious objects, as you would expect. Therefore, only few of the items arrived in Avignon, where they were always identified in early inventories as the old treasure or Boniface's treasure. Even in 1371, so a good uh, 80 years after the events, the wooden staff of your Boniface was still recorded. These objects were clearly important to the Avignon popes not only for their value, but also for the link they provided with the earlier Roman popes, um, and in particular with Boniface, uh, whose staff seems to have been preserved with reverence. After all, it was only a wooden staff. <coughs> Having therefore grown out of a jungle of an ad hoc collection of secular and sacred objects, the Avignon treasure comprised different things including all that was needed for daily life at the papal court, from liturgical objects to daily utensils. The inventories recorded furniture and plate, as well as reliquaries and liturgical vestments, silk and tapestries to decorate the rooms, and important parchments and documents of papal government. The papal bathtub in the Pope's bedroom was duly recorded as well as numerous images of the Virgin. And all types of books, of course, from law codes to Bibles, from missiles to the book of Aristotle. Together, all these objects formed the Thesaurus Romana Ecclesiae or the Thesaurus Domini Nostri Papa. Especially under the pomp loving Clement VI, the treasure increased and at the same time became something of an institution under the control of different and specialized officers, such as the Buticularius, the master of the plate, the Custus Serre, the keeper of the wax, and the master of the chapel. They were under the overall authority of the treasurer, who, whose role also changed, uh, that relates to Susanna's paper. Uh, he became much more of a treasurer in the modern British sense, in the person responsible for finances during the 14th century. But all of the, the whole kept, was, remained under the authority of the Chamberlain, the Camerarius in the records, uh, which is the office that Pierre de Croce occupied in 1378, and I think very similar uh, really to the keeper of the wardrobe that Jeremy talked about for the English kings. This specialization of the guardians or officers and the many inventories written at least give an idea that there was an interest um, by the popes and by, on the side of the popes to demonstrate and not only to protect and organize the treasure but also to categorize the objects, at least give them to different uh, officers. And of course the main criteria was to keep the objects in a safe place. And I just wanted to show you one of these inventories. This is the one, the general inventory of the paper palace made in 1769 for Urban V, who was at the time in Rome. Providing appropriate and secure, uh, secure places for the treasure and the palace was paramount for the Avignon Popes from the moment that Clement's successor, John the Twenty Second settled into the old Episcopal Palace adjacent to the cathedral in Avignon. And this is after pressure uh, what the Episcopal Palace looked like. As part of the improvements that John the Twenty Second carried out to the old structure was also the construction of a treasure house here, which I believe entirely lost and we only know from the records and the inventories. It was probably there that Clive had skipped Outline. But when the next book, Benedict XII, started building a new palace from 1734, the treasure was certainly foremost on his mind, 
The first building he ordered to be constructed was a massive central tower, yep. with, uh, which was 42, still is 42 meters high, with walls of six meters thickness, which is called in the records Tourist Magna, but also Tourist Cesauri, Tourist Domini Pape, Tourist Santis Angolorum, and Tourist Plumbo Coperta after its lead roof, uh, undoubtedly. It was originally, as you can see in Kershaw's reconstruction, built to be freestanding with buttresses on all sides, and only as part of the second phase of construction was it connected, as you can see here, to the new paper chambers to the north. And this is a reconstruction of what it would have looked like at the time. Although the central tower is often described by scholars as a donjon of the palace, it's perhaps best understood as a fortified treasure house. Uh, uh, there was a lower vaulted cave, then there was a lower treasure, um, which I'll show you an image of in, the, uh, in a moment. Then there was, underneath the fortifications up here, there was an upper treasure, so two treasures, a cave, and sandwiched between them, the greatest treasure of all, which was, of course, the Pope in his bed chamber here, all guarded by the chamberlain uh, uh, who watched over the whole of it. When Clement VI, Benedict's successor, added two more wings to the paper palace to create another courtyard, the Magna, Magna Tourist, Tourist Magna here remained, uh, of course, a treasure house, but also became something of a pivot for, a whole, for the whole palace. Because the most important construction of Clement VI buildings was the Great Chapel, which occupied this entire place. It replaced an earlier chapel here. Um, and you can see how the tower now connects the two parts of the private buildings that the Pope moved in and out of Black Pivot. It is clear from the inventories that the interest in organizing and categorizing the treasure under the care of various officers had only limited effect on the storage of the treasure. Compared to some contemporary inventories, like the French royal ones, some of them, the paper ones appear particularly unsystematic. As a general rule, everything could be stored anywhere, um, even outside the uh, uh, treasuries, with only some exceptions, as I will explain. So if you first start with the Great Tower, the lower cellar uh, here served at least at one stage as a wine cellar, especially for wines of bone. The Pope's always knew what was good here. Uh, but the upper treasure, is effectively, as we've already noted elsewhere, the most decorative room uh, with rib boards springing from an elegant central column. The room is nine meters high um, and the boards are four by boards. It was clearly entirely filled with chests, coffers, and bags that were, as we've heard before, also here classified by the letters of the alphabet. The 1342 inventory, for example, lists first of all monies in different currencies. Then cups, bowls, plates. Next, various types of textiles, among them two pieces of jasper red cloth that were hung in front of the window from where the indulgences were given. Uh, this is 1342, so before the present indulgences window was built, one wonders where the old one was. Uh, then also, this is special for Yana, two cloths that were used to decorate the famous bridge of Avignon when bus guests were arriving. But the, list, the same list also included various liturgical coats decorated with gold thread and pearls, Bibles, and liturgical books. Most, um, uh, more storage room could be found uh, below the paving stones. There were cavities of 1,50 meter in depth, which were probably reserved for more important objects. Certainly during the Restoration, archaeologists found gold and lead bulls, remains of wax seals and fragments of grisaille glass, probably from the windows. At the accession of Innocent VI, the room was filled with treasures of recently deceased cardinals, bishops, and abbots. 
Of course, as you may know, the popes reserved for themselves the so-called right of spoil, the right to encourage the good of higher ecclesiastics on the grounds that their belongings were the possession of the church with the Such treasures were often sold or simply integrated into the papal treasure. And I wondered whether in 1352 there were so many still around, still not integrated in this lower treasure, whether this was perhaps a result of the Black Death in uh, 1348. So, as I already said, above these books came the room of the Chamberlain and then the Papal Bed Chamber, which you all know. And then the upper treasure called the Tori Superiori in the records. Here, too, all kinds of objects were stored in chests and coffers, each marked with a letter of the alphabet. And I can't really see a big difference between the things that were kept in the lower treasure. Uh, to those that are kept in the upper treasury. So, for example, again, one list includes such items as the tabernacle of the Virgin, the pyx, a barber's bowl, <coughs> two blue angels, a salt cellar, and a crystal vase, <coughs> all in one list. However, this upper room did also have a special function. At least from the time of Innocent VI, it was divided in two, as Gabriel <coughs> Colomb has shown beginning of the 20th century by a screen. And there's evidence that on the <coughs> south side, uh, the screen was filled with shelves. They're called homunculi <coughs> in the records. And this must have been where the main paper library was stored, which at the best of times included about 2,300 books at least. Which, of course, doesn't mean that books weren't stored elsewhere. Um, and I should say that the paper chapel had its own library. But this is what, when the records talk of the Libraria Magna, this is uh, clearly what they mean. <coughs> um, there was also direct access to the room next to it, which was in the so-called Wardrobe Tower, which, just to remind you, includes the famous chamber itself, the star room, but it's on the level above here, where, to show you Coulomb's plan again, uh, when you come up, you can also go into this upper room. Uh, it's called the uh, Chapel of St. Michael, or also the Capella Secreta, excitingly, in the records. Um, and it was clearly used as a chapel and intended to be one under Clement VI, but from the time of Innocent VI, the successor onwards in the second half of the 14th century, this room was generally used as a storage room for treasure and probably no longer served as a chapel. The liturgical objects that were jumbled together with other items, as I've just described, were obviously not in current use. They didn't were used for church services, one assumes at the time. Because the objects that were used for the masses in the papal chapel were indeed recorded separately in the inventories and were specified as being under the custody of the Magister Capelli Papi. So this is a new chapel that Clement VI built. And there's an inventory from 1743, the time before this chapel was built, when the list of the objects that the capella includes is really quite small. There's just a couple of them. But then there's in the uh, inventory, the next big inventory, 10 years later, in 1753, there's about six times as many items in the capella for the new big chapel, uh, including an image of Christ, the apostles in silver, two golden candlesticks, a silver wheel cross, etc., uh, etc. Et Clearly, all was used to decorate this vast hall, which is 52 by 15 meters, uh, uh, and which strikes us so empty today, especially this is very elegant but nonetheless almost austere architecture. However, uh, it must have looked very different in the 14th century. There exists a contemporary description of the chapel in the palace of one of the cardinals just outside Avignon. And that description stresses that the chapel of the cardinal was so richly decorated that not an inch of bare wall could be seen. And I think that's what we have to imagine this chapel like too. We also know that it was divided into by a screen, 
Of course, it has the cathedral of the Pope on the left side, um, and uh, of course, this was also the place where um, the Pope played Arsenal for polyphonic music. So, it would have been an altogether sensual experience. As recent research, so where did they keep that stuff? As recent research, both documentary and archaeological has shown, um, the tower, which was built on the side of the chapel and built as an afterthought, was not so much built probably for structural reasons or to abut the structure of the chapel here, also it may have, of course, served that function too. But um, what uh, uh, Andreas hartmann wernig and other archaeologists point out is that in the accounts, this tower, which is now called the Tour Saint Laurent, is called Nova Tourist in Qua Erit Revestiarium, the new tower in which the vestiary is to be, and when it was built, and surprisingly, it's called the Nova Tourist in Qua Est Revestiarium, in which the vestiary now is. So clearly, the main um, uh, idea of building this tower was to create new spaces to house a new and enlarged treasure uh, for the chapel. Uh, and here's the tower uh, from the exterior. And here um, you can see the tower, of course, also consisting of various levels. But this is the sacristy or vestuary uh, that is adjacent to the papal chapel. And perhaps I should just say that this master of the chapel, um, as I think I said, he had his own library as well. And because we talked uh, earlier about accounts, he also had uh, his own accounts, and he uh, was known to buy liturgical objects uh, himself. However, all these objects, where are they? Excepting a small number of books, few of the objects recorded in the inventories of the Pope's Avignon can be identified as surviving today. In order to gain an idea of what the treasure looked like, one has to turn to objects given by the Pope as a gift to various people. And such objects survive just around the corner from here in the Victoria and Albert Museum with a pattern and a chalice that bears the papal arms here. Um, and they probably belong, uh, it would make sense, to a large number of chalices and patterns made for John the Twenty Second and given to him to, by him to various dioceses in the south of France. And there is uh, at least another chalice surviving, quite similar. Or, of course, of course the golden rose here from the Music Cluny, a gift bestowed each year by the Pope on Luxury Sunday, the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent, on a high-standing personality who was in papal favor. Recently, however, <coughs> in the catalogue of the 2016-17 exhibition dedicated to Emperor Charles IV, Yeji Feit and Marcus Hirsch have been able to identify another gift. On the 6th of April, 1372, the Chamberlain, so it says in the inventory, the Chamberlain and the Treasurer went together to the upper treasury of the Papal Palace on the order of Pope Gregory XI in order to extract a gold cross with precious stones weighing four marks and 17 dinars, little less than a kilo. They also took out another cross which had previously been broken by a monk called Frater Veranus, <laughs> as mentioned, as well as several precious stones and a cameo. All this was used to create a new cross Prodando Imperatore to give to the Emperor, who was of course Charles IV. This cross must be the reliquary cross, now in the treasure of St. Vitus to Cathedral in Prague. At the center, a heavy crystal covers the relic of Christ's long cross, which, as the inscription says, Urban V had given to Charles IV. Kneeling on the left on the arms of the cross are Urban and Cardinal Pierre Roger de Beaufort, the later Gregory XI. And to the right are the emperor and sorry, what did you call him? It's useless call <laughs> son, Lethargic. Why well, he's quite clever, sort of medium active here. <laughs> In the past, it had been thought that Charles commissioned the cross. 
for the random state we see to open, and that therefore it must have been made in either Italy or in Prague. The new evidence suggests that the Crown Cross was commissioned by Irving's successor Gregory, and that it was made in Avignon, possibly by the Siennese artists who had been there present for many generations in the city, or alternatively, the Pope may have employed a particularly talented artist from outside Avignon to do this task. Of course, it was Gregory also who acceded to the Emperor Charles IV's dearest wish and took the papacy back to Rome. As we have already heard, his death inaugurated the Great Schism, and Avignon tragedies were once again in active use. The high period was, however, over for Avignon. Admittedly, the decline that has often been associated with the Avignon papacy during the schism has not been recognized to have been exaggerated. Clearly, papal liturgy continued to be celebrated with all the necessary pomp, and the pageant of the rituals did not lack in flamboyance. Nonetheless, as a 19th century art historian Eugène Muntz noted, the treasure was increasingly diminished. The cost of the wars in southern Italy, which was a payoff for the support the popes received from the Angevins, was probably one of the factors that forced the popes to sell much of their gold and precious objects. Even if there were no truth to the story told by modern Italian historians that the papal tiara, which Pierre de Croce had so successfully seized in 1378, had to be released from Paul <coughs> in order to crown Benedict XIII, the last Avignon Pope, certainly many other precious objects were definitely coined. The last phase of the Avignon treasure, under Pedro de Luna, who was elected as Benedict XIII in 1394, was undoubtedly the most dramatic and destructive one. Besieged by the French army, Benedict fled under cover of darkness from the papal palace on the 11th of March, 1403. Benedict, a lawyer and theologian, was an enthusiastic collector of books, and he carried with him his portal library, so a portable library, while he lived an itinerant life, moving between Marseille and later Perpignan. Finally, after the election of Martin V in 1417, he retreated to Peniscola, an impregnable peninsula on the eastern coast of Spain under the rule of the King of Aragon and the supporter still of the Avignon Pope. The entire treasure from the Papal Palace, including the Libraria Magna and what remained of the precious object, was then sent to Peniscola on boats, carefully inventoried. On Peniscola, Benedict lived another six years and continued to acquire new books for his library. When he died in 1422 or 1423, he was surrounded by small groups of cardinals and servants. One of them, Jean Carigny, arrived only after Benedict's death, and he arrived in December 1423, and he described how it found that the cardinals had already divided between them the money, the rings, the relics, the relics of the Holy Cross, and the saints, the chalices, and the vases in gold and silver. Only in 1429 did Pierre de Foix, the legate of Martin V, take possession of the place. By then, only 561 of the once more 2,000 books remained. Pierre de Foix sent many of these to a colleague college he founded in Toulouse, and from there they were sent to the Royal Library in the 17th century. One of them is the Lectura and Biblia by Dominicus Grima, uh, which is the manuscript. So some of them are in the Bibliothèque Nationale now. As for objects, there perhaps are more survivors than was thought of previously. A Coke made in Angus Anglicano, uh, now in Madrid, has been identified by Maria Angela Franco Mata as a gift from Benedict to the Collegiate Church of Santa Maria in Daroca, near Saragossa. And also, um, in, uh, in Madrid, there is a crozier, the hand of a crozier, 
which Jose Manuel Cruz Valdivinos thinks that the upper part uh, is perhaps from the time of John XXII, certainly the lower part here uh, was uh, in possession of uh, one of Benedict XIII, Pedro de Luna, remember, because we find his paper coat of arms, the cross piece, and the half moon for de Luna, his name. And uh, this uh, lower part of the star is certainly uh, similar to a chalice called Calza Papa Luna, which is apparently uh, still in the parish church of a peninsula. But of course, these are only small fragments of what once was one of the most important treasuries of sacred and secular objects. A treasury that is effectively lost to us due to Pierre de Croce's astute but ultimately disastrous annexation of the papal treasure in Rome in April 1378. 